Hey there, One Wing Jehudi here, and if you're like me, you can't get enough of fighting games. Today we're ordering the fighting games in my Steam collection from my least to most favorite. I want to emphasize I'm not ranking them based on which are objectively better games. Rather, my goal was to go through the list of fighting games and ask myself which game I would rather play if I could only choose one. Check the description below for a little bit more detail on how I came up with the order for this list. I also want to showcase the large variety of fighting games available on Steam. As much as I enjoy Steam, I don't think it does the best job highlighting actual fighting games. If you select fighting games or 2D fighter under the tags, you will see anything ranging from RPGs to open world action titles. So if you enjoy fighting games but don't care about my personal likes or dislikes, then consider this video an exhibition showing off a lot of the fighting games available on Steam. Maybe you'll come across one that you didn't know about, but looks interesting enough that you want to check it out. There are some notable exceptions. I will not be including any sort of smash or platform brawler type games. I personally don't care for them, nor do I own any of them on Steam, and for those reasons I've excluded them from this list. I also want to point out that this is not every fighting game on Steam, just the games I own. In the future, I may update this listing by adding other games in as I get them. Since this is a rather long endeavor, I'm going to keep my thoughts on each relatively short, but I'll try to give the gist of what I like about the game and what I dislike, if anything. And if it's a game I'm comfortable enough with to have chosen a main, I'll list them in the segment intros. Otherwise, I'll just list my primary interest. So let's go ahead and get started. Located. Do we have a problem? Ready? Engage. Punch Planet is a slick looking indie fighting game that is currently in early access. In many ways, this title is in a place that reminds me of Street Fighter V when it was first released. It has limited characters to choose from, only 8 currently with a planned total of 10 altogether. No arcade or story modes. In fact, it currently doesn't even have a survival mode or tutorial mode the latter of which intends to be implemented at some point. What I have played seems strongly influenced gameplay-wise by Street Fighter, particularly Street Fighter 4. That's not a bad thing at all, but as it stands, there's not much I'm able to spend my time on with this game. I do hope to return to it when it's finished. Decision player one. Call it in! One Strike is a pixelated take on something like Bushido Blade, except when the game calls itself One Strike, it means it. Land one blow on your opponent and the round is over. It's similar to Dive Kick, simplistic but entertaining, and though it's very low on my list, that doesn't mean it's a bad game. Rather, I'd say it's a humble game, not just in gameplay, but presentation and game modes. It can be enjoyable for local versus play, but I think most fighting game fans will view it as a novelty. A fun but short experience ahead of the feature presentation.
Want a little cheesecake in your diet? Well, Fight Angel's Special Edition is the epitome of it. This all-female fighter originally came out around the time of Street Fighter V's abysmal launch, and it promoted itself as the antithesis to the censorship slash cancellation movement that seemed to be taking precedent at that time. Going so far as to have the clothing tear completely off the characters and wind up destroyed throughout the match. I suppose seeing women literally beat the clothes off each other is every teenage boy's fantasy, but it doesn't change the gameplay, which I find pretty stiff and unmemorable. Perhaps its most popular feature is the create a character mode that offers an array of options to create whoever you want. Yes, honey, that means I created you. Sorry about that. Back in the 90s, when Mortal Kombat was all the rage, of both fans and opponents alike, several companies attempted to capitalize on that fame and create their own fatality-laced fighters. Eternal Champions is one of those. Now during that time period, I only had a Super Nintendo, but I remember hanging out with a friend across the street who had a Sega Genesis. Where I had Mortal Kombat, the bloodless version distributed on the SNES, and Final Fight 3, he had Streets of Rage 2 and Eternal Champions. As a kid, it seemed like it was a struggle to pull off the fatalities in this game. And as an adult, well, that hasn't changed. In fact, this entire game is a struggle. The AI is indomitable. And the fact the final boss has eight health bars to your one is seriously something out of a sadist's playbook. For me, this one is exclusively about nostalgia. On a side note, there's a really interesting documentary piece by YouTuber Matt McMuscles that details the unfortunate history of Eternal Champions. I think it's a really interesting watch and I'll leave the link in the video description below. In at number 77 is the 2D Dojin fighter Vanguard Princess. There's an emphasis on cheesecake here, and it has an overall indie flash game feel to it. Which isn't terribly surprising when you realize the game was made with Fighter Maker 2nd back in 2009. Honestly, I got nothing else here, but at least it plays like a fighting game. <laughs> Pocket Rumble reminds me strongly of the Capcom vs SNK Neo Geo Pocket game, but with original characters. And I like that original content here, both the character designs as well as the music, but this game's AI is all over the place. When I played through the arcade mode, it took me upwards of 15 to 20 minutes just to beat the first opponent, but then the second one I cleared in one attempt. Additionally, the special move mechanic is really difficult for me to get adjusted to. Rather than inputs or charge motions, you generally hold diagonal back, down, or diagonal forward down, and an attack button. While it seems simple enough, this is something I just can't get comfortable with, and the game's AI will be sure to punish you for being even the slightest bit late on any combos. To note, this game is incomplete, lacking the last character that was supposed to be added in by now.
Another pixel indie game, Blades of Gory is simple and violent. With odds against you bosses and a limited number of retries, Blades of Glory demands you discover AI exploits and use them to your advantage. It's classic gaming wrapped up in a modern retro creation. I love the pixel art and the game is certainly challenging, but as with One Strike, it's limited in modes that enhance replayability. Dive Kick's simplicity and lack of game modes keep it low on this list, but its humor and homage to fighting games keeps it off the very bottom. Check out episode 0 of Keyboard Chronicles for more information and some gameplay. I can sense your blood. <sighs> Terradrome Reign of the Legends is the quasi sequel to the original Terradrome. Now, the original free game had copyrighted properties, so that obviously wouldn't fly without licensing for a paid product. So, the developers used several folklore, urban legend, and public domain characters to fill the roster this time, as well as a few homages. And I'm honestly okay with that. It's nice to see the developer's own character designs. The game's roster isn't completed yet, and things are both bare bones and rough around the edges, but I can't help liking what's there thus far. Clash of Souls! First conflict, destiny awaits. Dual Souls The Last Bearer is the latest in a series of fighting games that originated on the Game Boy Advance. It's pretty simplistic stuff, and at first seems to play like Samurai Showdown, something where the best combo you can pull off is only a few hits. But searching this game online will reveal a certain dedicated few who showcase exactly what you can do here, and it's pretty impressive. In keeping with Sam Show, you can defeat your opponent and literally slice them in half, albeit in silhouette scenes. But it's surprisingly decent for an indie game with such humble origins. An Arxis game, Battle Fantasia attempted to play off the popularity of RPGs in Japan by creating a fighting game set in a fantasy medieval setting, complete with labeled health bars and visible number depletion representing taking a hit and damage to your health bar. In addition to this setup, the gameplay was simplified in an effort to not only bring in more players, but also female gamers as well. The game released during the fighting game Dark Age, that time period between Street Fighter 3 Third Strike and Street Fighter 4, and this game didn't do too well in sales or reviews. While I appreciate the fantasy setting and the included story mode, I'm not terribly interested in the combat system or many of the playable characters. Fun fact though, this game has to have one of the lowest global achievement statistics for a fighting game on Steam. The highest attained achievement, Beat the Arcade Mode Once, only has a 5.9% completion rate. And perhaps this game's biggest claim to fame is that it was the artistic inspiration behind Street Fighter 4. Two Strikes is the sequel to One Strike, and uses a much more stylized approach than the humble pixels of its predecessor. The art on the characters is awesome, and as usual, I love the tension of these type of games. 
Now two strikes features two types of attacks. A weak strike that takes two hits to defeat your opponent, and a strong strike which only takes one. The unfortunate thing is that this game has a very limited selection of characters and game options, and is still considered early access. The team behind it is very small, only three people to be exact, and they've apologized for the delays on the game. I can only wish them the best, and I look forward to seeing what the complete game turns out like. I'll certainly be waiting. An indie fighter whose aesthetics are like a mishmash of the original Street Fighter 2 and Fatal Fury. Verdict Guilty's mechanics are simple, like many of the titles down here, but everything being hand-drawn pixels and having an 80s vibe to it makes it a lot of fun to play. It also has an interesting handcuff mechanic for some of the characters, which reminds me of the Street Fighter 2 Guile handcuff glitch, though thankfully it doesn't break the game like that. The oldest King of Fighters game available on Steam, KOF 97 would rank higher if it were 94 or 95, simply because of Rugal and his laughable dialogue. As it stands, it's a competent fighter and finishes off the Orochi saga, but for me, it's outdone by every other KOF available on the platform. The first collection on the list, Samurai Showdown Neo Geo Collection, features seven Sam Show games across five titles. For me, this game was a novelty. I never played Sam Show growing up, so I didn't have any nostalgia when playing it now. I do wish this game had Samurai Showdown 6, which was a title I bought and played while I was visiting Japan. But as that game was never part of the Neo Geo arcade slash console platform, it is sadly omitted. I have to say that I did love that this collection was a veritable gold mine for SNK translation flubs. Since it's a dream match, King of Fighters 98 Ultimate does score slightly higher than its predecessor, simply due to the amount of characters you can play with here. But otherwise, there is still yet another 2D KOF game out there that I enjoy more. For what it's worth, this title does seem to be considered the best KOF to date, and most fans would strongly suggest it to new players as an introductory point to the series. In 2018, SNK opted to capitalize on the marketability of the King of Fighters female cast and released this out to the public. SNK Heroines Tag Team Frenzy features several of the franchise's mainstays and even a Rule 63 Terry Bogard. But I think the most interesting aspect of this game is that SNK has confirmed it is actually canon to the storyline, nestling between KOF 14 and 15. 
Now, as the name states, this is a tag team type of fighter, but there is a very different spin on the matches here compared to any other fighter. Your goal is not necessarily to drain your opponent's life bar to zero, but rather to perform a super move on your opponent once their health has passed a certain critical threshold. It's bizarre to say the least, and I don't think this game will ever be headlining pro tournaments. In many ways, it's more or less a cheesecake novelty, which, to the game's credit, it doesn't take itself seriously. I think I find myself appreciating SNK's art and the goofy cutscenes more than I do the actual gameplay. Guilty Gear The Missing Link is the first game in the series, and it's absolutely broken. But it's enjoyable to play for fun, and there's a story to it that is still relevant to the franchise. Beyond that, I don't think it serves anyone to play this game unless you are really vested in Guilty Gear lore, or simply want to play a busted mess of a fighter for laughs. For more info, check out episode 4 of Keyboard Chronicles. Yatagarasu Attack on Cataclysm isn't a bad fighting game, but a top-down look of the reviews on Steam might lead you to think otherwise. Yatagarasu is a crowd-funded fighting game developed by a very small team, but the game has since been abandoned and is currently missing some of its promised features, including rollback netcode, which was an accomplished stretch goal. Its in-game sprite style reminds me of King of Fighters, and I like the characters I see, although admittedly the user interface seems fairly outdated, and some would no doubt like to see a bigger roster. I can appreciate what's here regardless, but just a bit before writing this script up, New Media, Yatagarasu's publisher, closed down permanently. It seems as though the rights to publishing the title were given back to the developers, and since they're apparently AWOL, it doesn't appear that this IP will move forward anymore. The main Blaze Blue games will appear further down on this list, but the first one to appear here is Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle. As denoted by the title, this is a tag fighting game, 2 vs 2, and features characters across a wide variety of fighting games. I think the game looks nice, and if you're a fan of all the other franchises that appear here, many of which are available on Steam, then you'd probably be pretty stoked by this IP. Unfortunately for me, there are very few characters here that I actually gravitate to in their respective series, and that equally applies here. I can appreciate the inclusion of some characters who don't have their own fighting games, but I know I'd like this game a whole lot more if the roster participants for Blaze Blue, Persona 4 Arena, and Undernight Inbirth had other characters in them. Another puzzling thing is that this game lacks an arcade mode. Its closest option is episode mode, which functions more like a story with drawn out dialogue sequences, similar to what you'd see in Blaze Blue. I cannot lose until the day I complete my mission. Yan! Orie! Win! <laughs> Of all of SNK's titles, the Fatal Fury series is my favorite. Geese is a classic villain, and Terry Bogard, Mai Shiranui, Kim Kapwan, and many others are icons of the fighting game genre. Garo, Mark of the Wolves, was SNK's response to Street Fighter III complete with more fluid animation movement, its own parry system, and an almost entirely new cast. It is chronologically the last game in the Fatal Fury series. So as much as I enjoy Fatal Fury, you may be asking why this game is so low on the list. 
Well, the primary reason is the roster. With the exception of Terry and Rock, I just don't find any of the other characters terribly interesting. I like that the game has callbacks to other fighters from the Fatal Fury universe, but otherwise it just doesn't really do anything for me. I am excited with the news that there will be a sequel, and I hope they fill up the roster not just with Garou characters, but also some throwbacks from Fatal Fury. Comparisons to Samurai Showdown will likely be made upon first glance, but I really enjoyed The Last Blade much more than Sam Show. Apart from the gameplay being different with a more common emphasis on combos, I love the backgrounds of The Last Blade. There's something about them that really feels like the matches are taking place in Japan around the middle of the 19th century. The characters are diverse without reaching fantasy levels like Sam Show, although Shigen arguably tries to push that boundary. But the series still maintains an interesting and otherworldly story, a very common trope for SNK games. No surprise here, The Last Blade 2 is nominally better than the first game, with a few new character additions being the primary reason for that, as well as more emphasis being put on the story. Like the first game, it features some beautiful backgrounds. I admit, I really missed Last Blade's bridge stage, and I'm not a fan of Last Blade 2's village equivalent, Port City Building. However, I find Last Night of Yukimachi is a beautiful background. Million Arthur, Arcana Blood, is a fighting game made by Square Enix, which guest stars Iori Yagami from King of Fighters. If your reaction to that sentence was, what? Then we're in the same boat. Iori was the primary reason I picked this game up, but to my chagrin, he's not available in arcade mode. This game follows a franchise that revolves around parallel universes or alternate timelines or something I'm honestly not too sure. It does feature a support system, but I don't mind how it's implemented. And for fighting game newbies or casuals like myself, it includes an auto combo system that can be nice to fall back on at times. The game is easy enough to play, but it has a limited roster of selectable characters, with three of the 13 total characters not even having a story mode. On a side note, there are plenty of assist characters to choose from. Over 30, actually. One thing I found funny, when I first tried the game out, I left the keyboard controls as they were. It's a very awkward layout by default. But somehow, I managed to beat my first opponent on normal difficulty and simultaneously unlock five achievements. For not watching the tutorial or remapping the buttons, I think that was a first, and I had a good chuckle over that one. A girl exclusive fighting game, I was interested in Koihime Enbu due to its loose basing off of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. Apparently the game is also based off a series of adult manga or animation. I'm not entirely sure and I have no intention of determining it either way. The game itself is enjoyable. It has a somewhat limited fighting system, nestled sort of in between Fantasy Strike and earlier King of Fighters titles, or any other older four-button fighter. It has a system that prioritizes footsies and ground games, as jump-ins are incredibly unsafe and open up a world of high-damage air-juggling combos. But unlike other fighters, the air juggles have a very reasonable learning curve. They're done in the confines of characters having limited movesets, and in this case, that's not a bad thing. The game would probably rate higher for me thanks to the mechanics, 
but a lot of the characters, either in the way they control or their aesthetics, aren't appealing to me. While I love Street Fighter and could get behind Capcom creating Tekken's characters in their own style and for a 2.5D fighting game, I was terribly turned off by the mechanics of Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Swapping characters in and out mid-move to extend combos or calling a teammate in to assist was just something that's never appealed to me. On top of that, I despise how a round in Street Fighter Cross Tekken is over when only one of the two selected characters runs out of health. This of course is customary to Tekken's tag match rules. The game is as high as it is because I love seeing the Tekken characters fighting on a 2D plane and I'm a sucker for fighting game crossovers between major franchises. Power Rangers Battle for the Grid is a 3v3 fighter in the vein of Marvel vs. Capcom, as opposed to the turn-based 3v3 of King of Fighters. For anyone who grew up in the 90s and 2000s, this is likely dripping with nostalgia. I enjoyed Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and I stuck with the series up through the first movie, but dropped out shortly thereafter. So while there are many characters in this game that mean nothing to me, I do enjoy the ones I recognize, and the additions of Ryu and Chun-Li from Street Fighter, complete with their own Power Ranger outfits, is also something I appreciate. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about the gameplay, and the game is this high up almost exclusively due to nostalgia. To elaborate on what I said prior to the Street Fighter Cross Tekken portion of this video, one thing you'll learn about me is that I do not like tag-style fighting games. I prefer one-on-one -on -one with no assists, and that is everything Power Rangers Battle for the Grid isn't. In terms of what's here, look, it plays solid, but I feel that there is a considerable learning curve early into the game as opposed to later. The AI is truly unforgiving, and it is not uncommon for a computer opponent to hit you with a 30 plus combo on easy difficulty. Let's get first things first here. SNK vs. Capcom Match of the Millennium is not where it is because of its fantastic gameplay, beautiful art, or flawless controls. This is a port of a Neo Geo Pocket game. It's fairly limited in its capacity and the controls can be a bit awkward to work around, but I'm a sucker for the Capcom slash SNK crossover titles. And that includes this one. It's awesome to hear classic themes in the game, and the throwback to Krauser's chamber with the orchestra playing Mozart was... A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. I also love the artwork, and seeing M. Bison team up with Geese is just awesome. This probably isn't on any professional fighting game fan's most wanted list, but I couldn't pass it up. Though I do hope that Capcom and SNK can get a deal going to release Capcom vs SNK 2 on Steam. Please. Would you like to have a match with me? I'll take on whoever wants some of this. The latest game in the Marvel vs. Capcom franchise, Infinite switches things up a bit compared to the previous iterations. While it is still a tag team game, the teams now consist of only two characters rather than three. There are no assist moves like previous games, and instead, the focus is on its active switch tagging system. The X Factor from Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is replaced with the Infinity Stones. Depending on which stone you select, various types of buffs or supports will manifest temporarily. The game also features the auto-combo system, 
I don't think this game is as frantic as the previous Marvel vs. titles, and while I can appreciate that and the helpful auto combos, I think overall the game pales in comparison to its predecessors. The backgrounds seem wholly empty compared to MVC3, and I'm not personally thrilled with the roster. Now this game seems strongly tied to the MCU. A lot of the characters on Marvel's side were involved with the movies and even have costume designs reminiscent to those found in the films. This isn't a bad thing inherently, it does capitalize on silver screen popularity after all, but there's some really weird limiting going on here. According to the PR at the time, there are no X-Men characters in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite because Quote, your modern Marvel fan, maybe they don't even remember some of the X-Men characters. Now, I have my gripes related to comic books, superheroes, and both of their directions in the United States. But Marvel fans not knowing who Cyclops, Wolverine, Magneto, or Storm are? I don't think we've fallen that far. Not yet, anyway. Umineko Golden Fantasia is an interesting fighting game. Similar to some of the other anime fighters earlier in this list, it follows a franchise comprised of visual novels, manga, and who knows what else. Pachinko slots, probably. As for the story, I can't even begin to describe it and probably barely understood a fraction of what I read on it. But it seems to involve alternate timelines, Oedipus Rex levels of tragedy and death. Lots and lots of death. Particularly characters dying repeatedly. Golden Fantasia seems rooted in the core premise of Umineko, but veers off on its own story. But honestly, the most striking thing about this title is its setting. Taking place predominantly in and around a family mansion, the whole thing reminds me of Clue, 13 Dead End Drive, or Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. Many of the characters are designed with Victorian-era European dress, and it's very striking compared to what one typically sees in fighting games. The weirdest aspect of this game is how its 2v2 system works. Your two characters do not share super bars, and as you battle and fight with one character, this actually builds up the meter for your other one. I think this system is designed to encourage the switching out of characters, but as I've said before, I don't care for tag format in fighting games, and forcing me to swap out characters in order to take advantage of key aspects of the game is a bit jarring. It is also the main reason this game isn't higher up on the list. Them's Fightin' Herds is what came about from a My Little Pony Friendship is Magic fan game after Hasbro issued a cease and desist. The team was contacted shortly after by the Friendship is Magic creator Lauren Faust, who offered to create a new cast of hoofed mammals for an original IP fighting game, and thus Them's Fightin' Herds was born. Now, I'm not a brony, nor do I care for anthropomorphs, and looking at the relatively slim roster of four-legged hoofed beasts, I wasn't terribly interested in this game to start. But after playing it, this fighter is truly solid. The gameplay is a streamlined, four-button style, and there's a lot of character built into it, which I think is one of the biggest draws for this game. There's a story mode, arcade, tutorials, and online. And they're continually adding new characters to the roster. A 2D fighting game mashing up characters across the Nitro Plus visual novel and game universes, Nitro Plus Blasters Heroine's Infinite Duel actually plays pretty smoothly. It's a fast-paced anime fighter that uses assistance to string in longer combos or help put you on the offensive. 
Although I'm not the biggest fan of assist functionality in fighting games, the cooldown timer is decently long, and the game in general isn't as chaotic as others in this similar subgenre. To be fair, I have no clue who 90% of the characters in the game are, nor did the game's story make much sense to me. The options are pretty limited, and there's little chance of playing someone online if you haven't set up a session in advance. So, while I enjoy Nitro Plus Blasters, the relatively small roster, compared to many other titles here, and limited replayability keeps it lower on the list. If you thought Yori Yagami in a Square Enix fighting game about a bunch of different characters named Arthur was weird, wait till you play this one. Blade Strangers is from developer studio Saizensen and is more or less a mishmash of characters from their other franchises, as well as guest characters including Shovel Knight and Isaac from The Binding of Isaac. The graphics are nice, and the game was simple enough to get into. Sadly, I'm not too familiar with virtually any of the fighters in this game. So, when my character, the cute and totally normal looking Kawase, suddenly whipped out two kitchen blades and began sadistically knifing her opponent laying on the ground, well then. I like this game, but there's another Blade title the developer came out with that I enjoy a bit more. He stole her from me. I struggle with NetherRealm Studios games. On the one hand, I think of them as solidly developed and produced fighting games with a boatload of single-player content. On the other, the characters always feel janky when they move, and with a baked-in dial-a-combo system that I'm never fully comfortable with. At the time, Injustice was a nice foray into the world of DC Comics. But my feelings on NRS games combined with the superior Injustice 2 keeps this game lower on the list. The game isn't even installed on my computer at the time of recording and writing this, so you're getting the official trailer for the gameplay in the background. Trust me, it's far better than anything I would have done in-game. Earlier on, as I was building this list, I found it a struggle to determine where many titles would sit when compared to this one. Fantasy Strike is fairly limited in a lot of ways, but I really like the characters, designs, and some of the single player modes. It's a fighting game that I can pick up at any time and not take too long to get back into the groove of it. Episode 2 of Keyboard Chronicles is all about this game, and I still think it's a great introduction to playing fighting games on a keyboard. Remember what I said about those tag-style fighters? Well, this proves it. I've never been able to get into the gameplay of the Marvel collab games, whether it be Marvel vs. Capcom or X-Men vs. Street Fighter. The frenetic, fast-paced action combined with team management and abundance of assists is, quite honestly, too much for me to handle or try to adapt to. I'm not afraid to admit that I am horrible at these games and I've no desire to ever get better. So, I think it's a good time to remind viewers that I'm not saying this game is bad. Not at all. But, if I personally had only one fighting game to play, there's close to 50 some odd other fighters I would choose over this one. It also doesn't help that I'm not as happy with the roster in this title as I am with Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and the characters I do like have outfits that I don't care for.
Fighting EX Layer is a game which brings back the original characters from the Street Fighter EX 3D games and gives them their own title. Developer Arika designed both the Street Fighter EX series as well as their own original title, Fighting Layer, back in the late 90s and up through 2000. The gameplay in Fighting EX Layer is a bit difficult to get into if you aren't very comfortable with fighting games, but it honestly plays a lot better than I thought it would. I enjoy the character designs and overall I was pleasantly surprised with it. I don't think it was ever the main event at any major tournaments and I'm fairly confident to say that it never will be, but it's a very solid fighting game nonetheless. I have to say that I absolutely love the artwork too, so credit there to Naoki Imai. One thing I always find interesting is that the first teaser trailer for Fighting EX Layer came out on April 1st of 2017, and the initial audience reaction was that the trailer was an April Fool's joke. After all, it had been 17 years since these characters were last seen. Hey look, another NRS game that isn't installed on my computer. Well, it looks like more trailers for you. Probably my least favorite of the MK titles available on Steam, I remember thinking how it had the heart of Mortal Kombat, but not the soul. There is definitely something different between Mortal Kombat 9 and Mortal Kombat 10, and it's not just 10 superior graphics. The game seemed to take itself more seriously than previous versions, and I don't think I've disliked so many new characters in a fighting game this much since Street Fighter 3. When it debuted, it lacked stage fatalities and any other type of finishers beyond fatalities and brutalities, something that was nice but could require intricate or deliberate roundabout actions on your part to achieve. And even though they eventually added in a few stage fatalities, the game suffered from the same fate as Street Fighter V for me. By the time it became a finished product, the bad taste it left prior had already encouraged me to move on. Heaven or hell, duel, duel, one, one. Let's rock! I love Guilty Gear games. They're fun, the characters are loaded with development, and some of them tragic backstories. The story itself is convoluted, but it weaves together and through the characters. And the art itself has always looked great. Well, minus the missing link. Guilty Gear Zerd's art is equally beautiful, and Until Strive came out was probably the pinnacle of fighting game art. So why is this game relatively low on my list? One very simple reason. My main is not here. Yes, yes, I am one of those no biking, no buy Ken guys. But unlike the jokes about biking mains playing the game for a week and then dropping it, I play it for at least three, so ha. Boo, you stink! But in all seriousness, I really enjoy Zerd's sign. The roster is nice, the instant kill moves are flashy, and did I mention the art yet? In addition, the Zerd series as a whole keeps up the fast-paced action of the previous titles, something that Strive toned down considerably. I don't find myself needing to play this title, which is why the gameplay in the background comes from YouTuber Dom Perez. Okay, I will admit one thing here that I like about Sign over its successor title, Revelator. Sign is fully voiced in English. Phantom Breaker Omnia is an anime fighter. Well, a slower paced, less aerial one. And it's the latest update to the original Phantom Breaker game that came out in 2011. While almost all fighters have their own feel, Phantom Breaker Omnia seems very unique to me. It simultaneously bites off huge amounts from several other franchises, yet still feels like its own game. And I don't think I've ever seen a fighter so clash heavy. One thing that really stands out to me is the Spicy Edition update that was recently released. This adds a very over-the-top announcer, who I do have to admit is very entertaining. 
The game has mixed reviews on Steam due to issues that impact an overall sense of completeness. There's no tutorial mode or combo trial, and some aspects of gameplay aren't even explained, or explained well. Additionally, certain shortcuts like Alt F4 don't work in any capacity, forcing the less shortcut savvy to return all the way to the beginning of the game to quit. As of the time of writing this on a Saturday morning, there are only eight people playing the game. Keep in mind this game came out less than six months prior to when I wrote this. But for what it's worth, I find that it has several single player options like story, arcade, time trial, etc. And the gameplay is easy enough to get into. So personally, I am not complaining. When I first wrote this list up, Guilty Gear Isuka was actually at the bottom of the list. I remember buying it on the PS2 shortly after playing X2 Number Reload on the Xbox, and boy was I sorely disappointed. Although most of the gameplay was the same as the other games in the X2 series, and while I'm not opposed to what it tried, blending a 2D fighter with a beat-em-up, this has one of the worst game mechanics ever the requirement of using action buttons to face a different direction. Yes, this is the same mechanic that people dread and complain about in Mortal Kombat Mythologies Sub-Zero. I'm not saying I fail to understand why the mechanic was incorporated, but that doesn't change the fact that it's an awful mechanic. It turned me off immediately upon playing, and I more or less disregarded the game's existence until it came time to set up this list. To be fair to it, I gave it another crack this time using keyboard. And while the direction button gimmick is still annoying, it's somehow far more tolerable on a keyboard than a controller. I don't expect to be pulling off any fantastic matches, but even picking it up for a few rounds to record this reminded me that, hey, this game mechanic is rot, but it's still Guilty Gear at its core. What is the deal with anime fighters and their titles? Am I right? Uh, <laughs> Melty Blood Actress Again Current Code was a title I looked at and said, why should I care? Every time I would see art for the game, it always showed people dressed in attire you'd see on the street every day. A woman wearing a sweater and a skirt, a bunch of characters wearing generic school uniforms, a cat wearing clothes, a uh, Wait. Scratch that last one. But Melty Blood has a whole lot more going on for it than being some turf war in a park. Equipped with multiple styles of play, including simplified control schemes, and a solid roster of unique and sometimes bizarre characters, Melty Blood is a solid choice for your first anime fighter. The only downside is that it's a bit outdated, specifically graphic-wise. Hmm. If only a modern sequel were made. A little higher up than its predecessor, Injustice 2 is a game that I like better than the first, but every issue I have with NRS games is still here. I'm also not the biggest fan of the redesigns for many of the characters. The armored look has never done anything for me. When I do play this game, I find myself gravitating to the MK characters in it, Sub-Zero and Raiden, more than anyone else. Also, not a fan of the story. While NetherRealm Studios perfected story mode in fighting games, DC's obsession with making Batman untouchable and Superman a moron is so tiresome. And please don't tell me that Superman's ending in the story mode is canon, because no one is buying that, especially not DC. Yeah. <laughs> 
I remember back in 2008 when the first Arcana Heart game was released on the PlayStation 2 in North America. I was starting to get more into fighting games at that time, and despite knowing nothing about it, I blindly purchased the game. After an hour of playing it, I remember thinking, why did I buy this? Although I was big into anime during my teen years, that started to wane by the time I hit 20. And come 2008, I wasn't interested in it at all. So an anime fighter like Arcana Heart wasn't going to do much for me. Fast forward to today. I still don't care much for anime, except the older stuff. But my appreciation for fighting games has grown immensely. And Arcana 3 Love Max is a prime example. Maybe it's the game's larger roster compared to the first title, or my fandom for fighting games really has increased that much, but I definitely enjoy Arcana Heart 3. Compared to Blaze Blue or Guilty Gear, it's a much slower anime fighter despite the game still having lots of mechanics with crazy things you can do. The assist system, in this case choosing your arcana, isn't as intrusive as assists in other games, again despite the fact that it's very integral to the game. In short, I don't know if I've ever seen a fighting game as intricate and systematically loaded, yet at the same time also very unobtrusive. So yeah. A series I once thought was uninteresting is quite the opposite. <laughs> Didn't I just get done talking about this game? Arcana Heart 3 Love Max 6 stars is more or less Love Max, but with a couple extra characters and some mechanic changes. And unless you want to fight a giant mech on a platform stage in the story mode finale, this is the preferred version of the game to pick up. Let's get this out of the way first. KOF 13's sprite artwork is awesome. Some of the characters look a bit oddly proportioned, but as a sucker for sprites, I was more focused on how detailed and fluid everything looked. That being said, I remember being underwhelmed when I bought and played this game. Maybe it was because of not being a diehard SNK fan, but I remember not playing this title for very long. What also could have impacted that was Street Fighter 4's release, a game that, spoiler alert, is going to be much farther along on this list. Almost any title coming directly behind that one in my playlist would have had a difficult time competing for my appreciation. Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger is the first game in the titular series. This title spun off of Guilty Gear in that its creator, Mori Toshimichi, was invited to work on the Guilty Gear series by its creator, Daisuke Ishiwatari. Toshimichi is the creator of the Guilty Gear character ABA and worked on Order Soul for a later Guilty Gear X2 iteration. He opted to branch off while working for Arc System Works and developed Blaze Blue. There are a lot of similarities between Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear. They both feature angsty protagonists, authoritarian foils, brawlic grapplers, and overly zealous ninjas. But Blaze Blue has plenty of their own original characters, and the frenetic gameplay is solid and fun. This was another title I bought when it was released and found myself wanting more than what the game offered. Thankfully, Toshimichi and ASW did just that with later iterations. A recent release of a collection of older games, Capcom Fighting Collection presents the arcade versions of the Darkstalkers series, Hyper Street Fighter 2, Pocket Fighter, Red Earth, Cyberbots, and Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. While it's nice to have all the games in here, including their Japanese versions, I think the real draws to this collection are the Darkstalkers series and Red Earth. In terms of single player, it's relatively limited. There's only the arcade mode and training modes available, 
but considering how many games are in this collection and how many characters you can play across the board, it'll take some time to beat the game with everyone. I will say it's a shame that the game seems to have died off incredibly fast. During its first week of release, the game had 800 plus concurrent players, but it's tanked to less than 100 as of the middle of October 2022. Continuum Shift is the second game in the Blaze Blue series, and it gives us more of the goodness they introduced with the first title, but they bring more characters and game modes to the table. The story mode compounds on what the previous title did, intersperse matches between dialogue-heavy scenes depicting profile images of the characters against a scenic backdrop. I will admit here that the story mode in both this game and Calamity Trigger is definitely more about story and less about fights. It kind of seems like you'll play a 45 second match between 10 minutes of dialogue. In this way, Blaze Blue's humor helps get the story mode across the finish line. And on that note, I do find the English dub very solid for the Blaze Blue games. My experience with the Persona series is very limited. I remember when Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne came out for the PS2 in the United States. I played a little bit of it because it looked different compared to a lot of RPGs out there, but that was about it. I remember the covers for Devil Summoner, Persona 2, and Digital Devil Saga, but I don't recall ever playing them. Fast forward to 2022 when Persona 4 Arena Ultimax is re-released on Steam. The game was developed by, yep, you guessed it, Arc System Works. Man, these guys are busy. It shares some similarities with ASW's flagship title, Guilty Gear, such as having a burst meter to get you out of combos, a primary four button system, frantic aerial combat, and so on. I can't tell you much about how true anything stays to the story since I'm unfamiliar with any of the characters or the story itself of Persona to begin with. But I would imagine if you are a fan of fighting games and the Shin Megami Tensei series, this is very likely a euphoric nostalgia trip. The characters are quite diverse, and this game oozes personality. It also sports a respectable amount of single-player options. Considering the entire franchise isn't available on Steam, and the story, even when there is one, is nearly impossible to connect or complete, I think KOF 2002 is the best of the pixelated 2D era. There's a ton of characters to choose from, and they have a lot of match-start interaction. At this point, the graphics were aging pretty roughly, especially when you consider that Street Fighter 3 came out in 1998. I am a bit disappointed that this version includes the K49 rework known as Nameless, but what can you do? Well, for starters, try not to rip 99% of your character from a different IP. Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and Ultimate MK3 are available on this arcade collection on Steam. This is the nostalgia piece in my collection, as Mortal Kombat 1 was my first fighting game. I spent hours with it on the SNES, my fragile 8 year old mind trying desperately to avoid being knocked into the pit by the computer. On the playground during recess, or in the yard at home, I would race around with other kids, all of us pretending to be characters from the franchise. And for what it's worth, none of us ever got injured or actually tried to rip someone else's head off. 
I remember watching the movie on VHS in the furnished basement of my childhood home. Mortal Kombat was virtually everything when it came to fighting games for me as a child, so it's nice to have these games available for play, even if the AI is progressively nightmarish. This is the odd indie duck that sits higher on the pile, shoulder to shoulder with the mainstream titles out there. Slice, Dice, and Rice is a guilty pleasure and definitely my favorite one hit and you die game. It is absolutely beautiful. The sound and music are great and the controls are both fluid and simple. Yet somehow the matches can still be downright tense. There's only AI and local verses, but the AI is solid and definitely learns from and reacts to your attacks sensibly. Like Blades of Gory, it has the potential to be bloody, with decapitation available based on how you hit your opponent. As with many indie fighters, there aren't a whole lot of characters available, and you have to unlock all of them by playing through character story modes. Each one, however, is unique enough that it won't feel like playing the same person twice. It's a real shame the developers never made a sequel, and although the game has mixed reviews on Steam, I mean it when I say this is a gem in the rough. Yeah, I, I don't know how to pronounce that title either. Thankfully, you don't have to in order to enjoy this anime fighter. Undernight in Birth has some fantastic sprite art, a bevy of differing characters, and an absolute ton of gameplay. Honestly, this game isn't higher on the list for only one reason. There is an absolute boatload of game mechanics to this thing. From special cancels called Crosscast Veil Off, to a resource bar called the Grind Grid, the Powered Up Vorpal State, Concentration and Chain Shifts slash Chain Shift Cancels, Grind Break, and Smart Steer, which is a simple combo system that can be used in the middle of a normal combo to spit out moves that otherwise wouldn't link, and also don't normally correlate to the button being pressed. As wowed as I am with this game, there is absolutely no way my simple brain can handle all these different game mechanics on top of the standard ones visible in most fighters. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy it nonetheless. I just won't be winning any Undernight tournaments. Not that I'd win any fighting game tournaments anyway, or even place in one. <laughs> Remember several games back a title named Blade Strangers? Well, welcome to Studio Saizensen's other fighting game on Steam. Blade Arcus features characters from across the Sega-published Shining video game series. Since I didn't have a Sega console growing up, I first became aware of the series with Shining Tears on the PS2. Emphasis on aware, as I still didn't play the series. For anyone who has though, you'll likely find yourself right at home here. I love the artwork slash character designs by Tony Taka, and although the game features a support slash tag system and anime graphics, it is not a fast-paced anime air combo or air dasher. Some of the characters stand out more than the others with pretty creative concepts. For example, I instantly fell in love with Sonya when I found out aspects of her moves involve using her sword to play a violin that also doubles as her shield. Overall, I really enjoy this game. From my understanding, it's lacking some things that an updated console version has, which is unfortunate, but since the PC is my only source of gaming, I'm thankful for what we received here on Steam. <laughs> K 
Chaos Code reminds me of everything I enjoy about Undernight in Birth, but without the head-spinning amount of game mechanics. This game is an absolute treat. The characters are wide-ranging from generic hero to insane oddball and everything in between. Also, the main antagonist fights with morbid-looking... well... They're called sacrificial dolls, according to the wiki, but they straight up look like tortured human beings. I always enjoy villains being painfully villainous. This game also seems to have a lot of references or homages to all sorts of things. In one of the stage backgrounds, you can see Bob Ross painting clear as day. One of the playable characters is actually a brother and sister team named Kate and Sith, and another character has a move that turns their opponent into an off-putting version of Michelangelo's David statue. All of this just adds charm to the game, and really this is something worth checking out. To note, a long-awaited sequel is moving forward again after one of the game's creators, Michael Lynn, passed away several years ago. I sincerely hope his brother Mickey has had proper time to grieve, and I'm happy to learn he's ready to move forward on the title once more. I do hope that Arc System Works will pick up the sequel and release it to Steam once it's ready. Allow me to show you a power you could never achieve. Another Arc System Works title, Dragon Ball Fighters, may quite possibly be the game that rocketed ASW into the big leagues, on par with Capcom and SNK, and turning the 2D fighter market from a duopoly into an oligopoly. For as much as Guilty Gear is ASW's flagship series, and regardless of how beautiful Zerd looked, Dragon Ball Fighters raked in the sales. And understandably so. If you're a fan of Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball franchise, you can't go wrong with fighters. The game brings its IP back to the 2.5D environment of the early Budokai games, before Tenkaichi turned everything into an arena fighter. The graphics look fantastic, the moves are crazy, the gameplay is lightning fast, and ASW just did a great job all around. If you want a Dragon Ball game, I don't think you'll find a better one than this. As you may have guessed, the game isn't as close to the number one spot as it might appear it should be, but that's simply because of my dislike for Tag Fighters turning its ugly head once more. I have fond memories of the original Street Fighter 4. I played the game in Japan before it ever released in America, and this was the first fighting game I played online and found someone whom I could consider my equal. We played dozens and dozens of matches, with our win-loss record almost always hovering around the 50-50 mark. If you search my name on YouTube, you may be able to even find a few of the old matches that were uploaded years and years ago. Now, I admit the game is outdone by its expansions, which boast more maps, a bigger roster, and an additional ultra move for everyone. But there was just something fantastic about this game when it first debuted. Unlocking additional console exclusive characters only to be challenged by Akuma and then Goken, but I don't really talk about that guy and what he did to Street Fighter's story. Yeah, this game is one of my all-time favorites, and I think a worthy successor to Street Fighter 2 and Alpha 3. From a practical standpoint, Ultra Street Fighter 4 has so much more in it that it has to be higher up, but Vanilla Street Fighter 4 will always hold a spot in my heart. The final version of Dead or Alive 5, Last Round, is the far more successful predecessor to DOA 6. It's a solid 3D fighter, but one thing to note about this and DOA 6, customized controls are limited. I'm unable to use the numpad like I typically do. 
and this game also seems immensely more difficult than DOA 6, while also not as flashy as its sequel. But the personality of what made DOA, DOA, exists in full fashion here. For most fans, I think this is considered the last good Dead or Alive title. Because I'm not an ardent fan, having only jumped onto the series with DOA 4, I'm also not as picky about this franchise, and the flashiness of DOA 6 is more alluring to me. I enjoyed KOF 14 more than 13, despite it being a fairly bare-bones dive into 2.5D from SNK. Characters are all pretty smooth, and considering this game came out months after Street Fighter V, the 3D does look a bit outdated. In addition, there's a sort of childish look to the characters' faces, as if they attempted an anime style on them, especially the women. One of the most notable changes to compare and see this easily with is Mai Shiranui. Compare her face in KOF 14 to what would eventually come down the pipe with KOF 15. What I do appreciate is the drawn endings for the teams, and the fact that this game has some characters I like which have thus far been omitted from King of Fighters 15. Guilty Gear X2 is just a really solid fighting game. The sprite artwork looks great, the backgrounds are awesome, the characters are diverse, story driven, and unique. The story mode features multiple endings for all the characters that require different tasks to be completed, and obviously multiple playthroughs to see all of them. The only downside is that the series creator Daisuke Ishiwatari decided to retcon the story in the X2 games. Instead of it being a direct continuation from Guilty Gear X and leading us to the next titles in the franchise, this was summed up primarily as X2's main antagonist exploring alternate timelines. Some character introductions and changes were kept going forward, but otherwise it's not the most pertinent thing to Guilty Gear's story. But really, does anyone play fighting games for the story? Well, I certainly hope so, or at least show interest in the story, because this franchise has a lot of it. Blaze Blue is back with the third installment of the franchise. Phantasma Extend offers new characters and new silly story modes known as gag scenarios, as well as a retweak of the guard system. At this point, you'll either know if you like the franchise or hate it, so you won't be surprised with this latest game. Something notable is that this is the last game in the core franchise that has an English dub. For me, this is very unfortunate, as I love hearing the English voices for this series, especially Taokaka's. So at this point, I decided to count up how many fighting games on this list are developed and or produced by Arc System Works. 22. Arc System Works was involved in some way, shape, or form with 22 of the 81 titles on this list. That's over 25%. Anyway, jumping back to it, DNF Duel is one of the latest ASW games to be released, and it's based off the Dungeon Fighter Online IP. Taking character classes from its parent game, this fighting game's spin-off features the same beautiful art that ASW is known for, while incorporating a simpler control mechanic in similar vein to Grand Blue Fantasy Versus. 
Players can perform special moves by pressing one direction and an action button, or they can input the special move using standard motion inputs. EX special moves require the use of a magic bar, which gradually fills back up over time. I don't think this is a bad game, but it seems like I'm in the minority here. The game has a brutal mostly negative rating from the latest reviews metric, and a mixed rating at the full aggregate. I think a lot of this stems from a perceived lack of support from the developers, as well as complaints related to the MSRP, with some even arguing the game should have been free, sharing the business model of its parent IP. King of Fighters 15 is sort of more of the same from 14, but there are some graphical improvements as well as online ones. Indeed, the characters do look better compared to 14, and overall I would rather play this one. That said, there are even less options for offline or single player modes. Still, the functional story mode, i.e. arcade mode, with actual endings for each team is always nice. I also really like the stages here more than I do with 14, and some of the character redesigns are better. Black Suit Geese, for example, is pretty awesome. I would probably put this game higher on my list, but it's truly crippled by the limited amount of single player options. In speaking of fighting games with stories, Mortal Kombat 11 comes in at number 17. This was a solid game whose story mode was pretty satisfactory. I think NRS did a great job with it, and there are quite a lot of single player options here to enjoy. The game looks wonderful, and there's an absolute huge amount of characters to choose from. Although it took a while to include things like friendships, the game did feel more like Mortal Kombat than its predecessor. As with all of NetherRealm Studios games, there's a jarring stiffness to the character movement on the 2D plane that never allows me to feel completely comfortable. But there's no denying this is a strong title in the franchise. Hey look, this game again. Well, almost. Accent Core Plus R is the definitive version of Guilty Gear X2, but it includes the character ABA, who, by the way, is my friend Quattro's favorite character. Shout out to you, Quattro. The game gives you the option of playing the various versions of X2, as there were tweaks and changes made to the game over each iteration. If you want the classic sprite version of Guilty Gear, this is your go-to. It's still very solid in its own right, despite its age, graphical appearance, and probably being outdone by the Zerd series in almost every way. While I really found myself gravitating toward vanilla, I also acknowledge that Ultra Street Fighter 4 is the definitive version of this game. It is the most complete and with the most replayability, and as such it's higher up on the list. But I have noticed a few things that are pretty annoying. Ultra's arcade mode seems to always pick the same opponents and stages, and I get tired of seeing the same faces over and over. It could just be me, but it also feels like the AI in Ultra Street Fighter 4 is more easily susceptible to focus attack spam, even on its hardest difficulty. Regardless, the game is still solid and worth picking up. 
There are a lot of characters, including some classics that hadn't been seen in any capacity for more than 10 years. And as a bonus, you can download fan-made mods that provide new costumes, levels, and music, extending the game's shelf life even more. This is the Street Fighter game that I've played the most, and I've played it into the ground, at least back when it was the latest Street Fighter game. And that may play a huge role in why it's not higher up on the list. In addition, I like the character model style of Street Fighter V better, and that has also made it difficult to come back to this game. The Dead or Alive franchise is no stranger to controversy, but the latest in the series, Dead or Alive 6, may have finally met its match, and at the cost of the death of the franchise. Starting up DOA 6 doesn't provide any clues. The game looks nice, the gameplay is pretty well the same as it has been in the previous versions, but with a few additions such as finishing moves. Apart from the Koei Tecmo DLC model, which is you know, flood a game with DLC totaling over several hundred dollars. The heaviest criticism seems to be that the game withdrew its cheesecake visual appeal. While Dead or Alive in the past has always been known for its female fighters and their jiggle physics, underneath all that was a really fun fighting game. Fans came to appreciate both the cheesecake and the gameplay, and the two became inseparable. Koei Tecmo attempted to carve off the cheesecake in order to make a more reputable fighter, and it didn't go over too well. The sales were well beneath Dead or Alive 5, and the game didn't garner the professional support that the developers hoped for. Although I can understand fan frustration, I think because I've never been a huge DOA connoisseur, I'm not as troubled by this. And admittedly, I really like the addition of the flashy super moves and close-up cinematic shots. I am not a Tekken player. Although I've known about the franchise since at least Tekken 3, I never played a single game until Tekken 7. I jumped in and came to a very early conclusion. This game is easy to play. Like, really easy. So easy, in fact, that I don't even have to think about it. And that's when I realized that the game is defaulted to the auto-assist functionality. Whoops. Trying the game without it, well, didn't go too well. However, that doesn't change my opinion on the game. Tekken 7 is graphically beautiful, and there's a massive roster of varied characters to play as. It offers a lot of different single-player options, including two different story modes, arcade, treasure battle, character customization, and my absolute favorite, Ultimate Tekken Bowl. I cannot overstate how awesome Tekken's recurring bowling game mode is, and this one has several different modes within it. Overall, Tekken 7 is a game that gives players a lot to chew through. Perhaps if I give the game more attention, I'll appreciate everything available in here. But even as an outsider to the series, it's pretty clear to see there is a lot of content for the single player. While the older games offer me no nostalgia, I can very much appreciate the reboot of Samurai Showdown that SNK released a few years ago. The game is interesting to me in that the gameplay itself is much slower, and perhaps more intense, and the levels and music follow this concept. Although the gameplay isn't a one-hit kill game like some of the others on the list, the tension seems equally palpable. The slower pace is in direct conflict with many of the fighting games out there, and it's a nice alternative to the air-dashing 20-hit whirlwind fighters. 
as a major bonus for myself, SNK's decision to include Guilty Gear's Biken was absolutely perfect. And there is some beautiful art in this game that I find myself drawn to often. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, Soul Calibur. I'm not the biggest 3D fighter fan, but even I played Soul Calibur 2 when it came out on all three major consoles. To date, I think the Soul Calibur series is the best 3D fighting franchise out there. Sorry Tekken, no offense. And honestly, I'm not disappointed with the latest addition to it. Soul Calibur 6 has all the standards you've grown to expect with the series. Beautiful graphics, epic orchestras, create a character ring outs, and more recently, super moves. It also adds a new reversal edge technique, which seems to be generally disliked by the community. It creates a forced rock-paper-scissors environment that offers an unnecessarily strong boost of special meter. I can't really disagree with those points, but I enjoy the reversal edge for the aesthetics. The slowdown, the cinematic camera shot, the unique dialogue that comes out of it. It's all just a blast, much like the rest of the game. Plus, hey, I'm simple enough. I enjoy the basic RPS concept. Remember that game a long time ago that I said would be awesome if they had an updated modern version? Well, developer French Bread is back with the next Melty Blood game. Whereas DNF Duel has been heavily criticized, Melty Blood Type Lumina has been strongly received. Since its release in September of last year, French Bread has consistently supported the game, released developer patches for bugs, additional functionality and training mode, and new characters and stages, all free of charge. This game capitalizes on the strengths of its predecessor while bringing the 2D sprites into the present decade. Everything looks solid, the developer seems to be in step with a lot of the fan base. Especially after hearing the pleas to include Neko Arc in the game. And overall, I'm really excited to see what else is going to come down the line for this title. Another Arc System Works fighter based on an IP I'm unfamiliar with, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus gives us a fighting game set in a more fantasy, medieval world akin to Battle Fantasia. The characters are diverse and colorful, and as is the common theme with ASW, the art looks fantastic. The game also features an RPG story mode that is vastly different to anything I've seen in other fighting games. Notably, the base game as of right now is only $20, but that does omit 13 characters who are DLC, leaving you with just 12, one of which is more or less a unique twist on picking random select. Overall, I like the aesthetic of the game, and the characters seem to be more diverse than DNF Duel, which is a game I often equate to this one given the special move mechanics, developer, and backdrop. Skullgirls Second Encore is the latest version of an indie game that's been around since 2012, but you wouldn't know it. The gameplay is great and the animation is fluid, and there's quite a lot of single player modes to enjoy in the game. The team has gone through a lot over the years, and one could truly say that this game has been a labor of love. 
Speaking of which, I love Alex Ahad's art style, and I'm sad to hear that he's no longer a part of the development team. Out of all the games in my list, this is probably number one for the I wish I could play this game better category. I've never given the game the dedication or commitment it needs to be a viable player, as I think it's a very easy game to get into, but a very difficult one to reach the ceiling of capabilities. I think about the video by Sajurf on YouTube showing someone connecting a Touch of Death 66 hit combo off a single Beowulf grab, and I think to myself, yeah, guess I'll stick with my three hit combos. I do not put this game up this high on the list easily enough. I have been a vocal critic of Street Fighter V since its very first incomplete release. When the game started, it had very, very few offline options. The roster was unmemorable, and character redesigns were both off-putting and filled with unsightly clipping. The game was gradually updated in increments over time but I lost interest entirely after a subpar story mode. Fast forward to 2022, and the game is finally complete. All characters have been added in, a large arcade mode is now available, and Street Fighter V is packed with move challenges and extra battles. As a bonus for me, it also brought back my favorite Final Fight 3 character, someone I haven't thought about for decades. And as typical for a Street Fighter title, the gameplay itself feels smooth. Yet, I still have my complaints. The unsightly clipping has never been dealt with, and arcade mode's endings leave a lot to be desired. Honestly, I think the game is probably as high up on the list as it is, because I've played very little of it comparatively, so a lot of the added characters and modes still feel fresh. I've heard that Capcom has learned from their mistakes and intends to release a more complete base game with Street Fighter VI. Only time will tell, I suppose, but as it stands, now that Street Fighter V is a complete game, I do find myself enjoying the resumption of play all these years later. For the Shaolin! You will learn respect! Round one, fight! Also known as Mortal Kombat 9, this is hands down my favorite Mortal Kombat game. Although the graphics don't compare to 11, and there's a lot of criticism regarding the female anatomy here, this game was a delightful tribute to the Mortal Kombat games I grew up playing. I feel that this is also the title where NRS perfected the fighting game story mode, and with the babalities and stage fatalities available from the get-go, it felt like an old-school Mortal Kombat game, right up there with all the characters having the same aerial punches and kicks. The Challenge Tower provided a worthwhile time spend for single players, as did the other game modes. Mortal Kombat Complete Edition is one of the best. It's bloody, violent, and humorous without taking itself as seriously as the later games did. I mean, come on. What other game in the franchise are you going to hear Shang Tsung demand Shao Kahn not unload his children on him? The latest iteration of the Blaze Blue series, Central Fiction is just as good as all the other games, if not more so, for being the most complete. There are several types of game modes and a lot of characters to play as. My only major gripe with this game is that it did not receive an English dub. For many who prefer the original language, this means nothing. But as I mentioned in the previous Blaze Blue record, I always enjoyed the English voices, particularly Tao Kaka. 
Not having that here is a big disappointment for me. Now some kind soul did take it upon himself to create a mod for the game which converts as much of the dialogue to English as possible, but this is strictly related to in-match moments. Unfortunately, even if ASW decided to dub it or dub the next game in the series, should one ever come out, my beloved Tao Kaka would need a new voice actress, as her original one passed away a year ago. Everything you expect in Blaze Blue is here, so if you're a fan of the series, there's no reason to ignore this title. Whereas Street Fighter V now offers arcade modes that impersonate the older games, this collection brings the real deals to your Steam library. Packed with every core Street Fighter game, starting with the original and all the way up through Third Strike, this is one of my favorite collections on Steam. With so many titles to choose from and an AI that is oftentimes relentlessly cheap, you'll be spending quite some time making your way through all these. This is more of a nostalgia trip than anything modern. Only a handful of these games have a training mode in them, and I've heard some gripes related to these ports. So relatively speaking, there's not a whole lot to do besides online and getting your backside handed to you by the computer. But when it comes to these older titles, I think that's good enough. It's not like the games are a walk in the park on the hardest settings, or in some cases, even the easiest ones. <laughs> As I mentioned before, I'm one of those no biking, no biking guys. I always thought Zerg looked incredible, but when I learned biking wasn't in the game, I had zero interest in picking it up. I may not be good at Guilty Gear, but I did gravitate toward everyone's favorite one-armed female samurai while playing X2 Number Reload. Make no mistake, I enjoy a lot of the characters in Guilty Gear, now more so than ever before. But Baikin is just... Oh, beautiful. The deep voice, the battle scars, the fact that she does so much with only a single arm, and she's not bad to look at, obviously. Once she was released with Zerg Rev 2, I jumped on this title immediately. This game combines the modern visuals with the frenetic pace that described the Guilty Gear series up until Strive. For the old style of Guilty Gear games, I think this is the best. There's a robust roster, those beautiful graphics that I always talk about, a six hour anime shoveled into the story mode, flashy instant kills, and so much more. It's honestly a shame that Strive doesn't have half the content that Zerd Rev 2 does. <laughs> Speaking of which, here comes Strive. Apart from the developers somehow making an even more gorgeous fighting game, this title slowed the gameplay down. While it still has air dashing and air combos, the damage has been increased and combo potential decreased. Instant kills have been removed, and unfortunately, so have a lot of the single player game modes that existed in the previous titles. I really like what's here though. The arcade mode features an incredibly cheap special boss if you don't lose a single round. The upload a combo feature is fantastic for learning bread and butter and practical combos, which is something I think a lot of fighting games fail to do with their in-game combo trials. I'm not saying the combos aren't challenging or pretty when they're completed, but many of them seem highly impractical in a real game setting. With Strive's combo upload system, you are far more likely to find useful combos you can practice and pull off in actual matches. I also have to give it up to Daisuke Ishiwatari for the music in this game. Although the past Guilty Gear games have a handful of songs across the franchise that I enjoy, I by and large never really cared for it. 
but Strive's songs are incredible. The lyrics that are added to every song really push the songs into the stratosphere. I mean, come on. Knowing the song Let Me Carve Your Way is about Zato One's struggles across the series. How can you not feel emotional with its climactic final minute and a half? I also appreciate the slower gameplay of Strive compared to its predecessors. Now I understand why there are some people who genuinely dislike Strive's directional shift, and I don't blame them. At the same time, the decision was done to garner a larger fan base, and that seems to have been successful. Strive had one of the best PC launches for a fighting game to date, and its sales figures in general appear to be vastly better than Zerd's. I do hope that we'll get some more single player content at some point. I don't think that's likely, and maybe I'm a fool taking the role of a silly clown, but what can I say? I embrace the wounded soul. Okay, that's enough of that. I have to give my number one slot to the 2013 reboot of Killer Instinct. This game is... wow. There's a lot of content to hold over a single player gamer, plenty of characters to play through, fantastic visuals, and a combat system that is actually pretty easy to grasp, and made even easier with the built-in assist functionality. On top of that, this game legitimately sounds like you're playing in an arcade. Whether it's with headphones, speakers, or surround sound, the attacks, music, the announcer, it all blends together beautifully to sound straight out of old Chinatown fare. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Mick Gordon's fantastic and memorable music. The game also scores brownie points for me with the nostalgia trip. While Mortal Kombat was my go-to fighting game in my youth, Killer Instinct was always right behind it. I loved that it had fatalities like Mortal Kombat, but the cast seemed rooted in something a bit more occidental in its folklore, with a werewolf, pirate skeleton, and alien being just a few parts of the ensemble. The 2013 reboot gives me all those nostalgia chills, but ramps the franchise up into the modern century. I really, really like the redesigns of the characters, and in some ways, they show how simplistic or odd the old designs were. On a side note, I have to say that I'm surprised this game turned out as well as I think it did, considering the developer changes that occurred throughout. I would genuinely love a sequel, and while rumors abound about one being in development from Netherrealm to Bandai Namco and Enway, for now I can safely say I thoroughly enjoyed the 2013 reboot, which still plays fantastically almost a decade later. One step closer to flushing out Ultra Tech. So we finally reached the end of this list. If you sat through this entire thing and my boring, cheesy, low quality mic work, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate it, and I hope that this list offered you at least one or two glimpses into some titles you didn't know exist, but are interested in checking out. So, as always, have a good night, and I'll see you all next time.